Welcome back to the Blocks Retro Pay YouTube channel. Today we're going to be working on this Rockola Super Sound Jukebox. In the last part, I basically gave up on this motherboard, but we're back at it because today is another day, and today I have a lot of parts to install on this board. Are you fucking kidding me? Could this entire issue have been caused due to a bad EEPROM? Seriously? I decided, hey, let's back up the EEPROM. So I took this one out, read it, and then I decided, hey, why don't we just compare it against this one? And the verification failed. I'm like, that's weird. So maybe these chips don't verified properly. So I then grabbed the dump off of this one and verified it against itself, and it verified correctly. This one here, using the program from that one, fails. And even using the program that it read off of this one, fails. This chip is bad. This whole issue might have just been a fucking bad EEPROM. This is why you check EEPROMs, apparently. The larger chips verified against each other just fine. They're good. So it's, this one's just bad, which kind of sucks. I spent a lot of money, uh, well, it really wasn't that much money, buying a bunch of parts to rebuild this board completely. So that's seriously the issue. That's kind of unfortunate. Though, I'm pretty sure it was the other board that was bad, not the CPU board. I mean, the memory board. I thought it was the CPU board that was bad. I'm confused. Let's take that chip, put it on this one, and see if this board works. It actually might make sense. In the last part, I did find this tant was bad on the CPU board, so maybe that was the issue with this, and I was just running into a second issue with that ROM being bad. That would be kind of annoying, but it would make sense. Let's test that theory. I've put the ROM from that one into that one, so let's see if this board wants to work correctly with this CPU. That seriously appears to have fixed it. Now, I have noticed another issue, if this middle cable moves any, it throws it back into initializing lock-in. So it actually appears I was fighting three different issues that were all causing the same issue, which is kind of ridiculous, but at least I think I figured it out. Here's the board set back in the workshop. There's a few different ways we can fix that, but the main thing I want to focus on right now is this button doesn't work. It is stuck down completely. I'm not sure what button that is. Oh, enable pricing. That might be important to not be stuck down. Goodness, that's a lot of corrosion. Um, not sure how the hell it's supposed... Oh, there is a spring in there. Um, yeah, I don't think any of this is working right. Honestly, I think we're going back to my first plan of throwing this in an ultrasonic cleaner. I'm going to pull off these EEPROMs, mainly because I don't want to soak the labels, and uh, throw this thing in the ultrasonic cleaner. Or maybe we'll pull these buttons off, but honestly, no, because uh, both ends need clean. So we'll just leave it all together, pull off these EEPROMs, and throw this thing in an ultrasonic cleaner. I was really hoping that would fit. I guess uh, that's why I have a big one. We're looking better, but not perfect. That's uh, hopefully good for now. It's still a little wet up there, apparently. It didn't dry fully in the oven. As you can see, that looks a little bit better now. It still doesn't click, as I think the uh, springy part's dead. Let's pull another one of these off, just compare it, see what it's supposed to look like. That's what I thought. As you can see, the spring is stuck down. Not sure that happened, but I think just popping that out will probably fix it. So we got this one clicking again. I'm going through and I'm actually just cleaning all of these contacts as they still had a little bit of corrosion, so we're taking a fiberglass pen and we're just making them shiny so they have good conductivity. Now what we're going to do is take this fancy fiberglass pen, we're going to clean the pads on these just to hopefully prevent that issue whenever that cable was touched, it was causing the issue of knocking it back into the initialization phase. There we go, now that connector looks good as new, so let's put this thing back in the cabinet and see if we still function. Okay, I've tested this board set a couple times now, and it seems to be fucking rock solid. It takes like five seconds to initialize, absolutely perfect. I cannot believe that it was that stupid fucking EEPROM that was bad. I mean, it makes sense, honestly, because it probably wasn't fully bad, so it was probably, you know, intermittent, so it would work sometimes and not other times, which is exactly why this thing was driving me fucking up a wall trying to get this thing to work because I was finding issues over here, and with that bad tantalum capacitor, and uh, the hand with those dirty contacts, <laughs> it was a stupid fucking board. Now, that is still the EEPROM from the other set. I'm going to have to order a ROM and get that program. To be fair, in the last part, I would not have been able to even diagnose this, because at that point, I did not have an EEPROM programmer, so that's a new addition, and that's apparently very helpful, because otherwise, I would still be hunting this down, apparently. Going ahead and installing this battery here for the memory backup. I'm putting it in a socket so anyone can replace it, even if they don't know how to solder, because, well, not everyone knows how to solder. And I'm using this battery because this board set here has this same kind of battery on it, and it's been on it for probably a decade or so, and it's still at 3.6 volts and hasn't leaked any, so it seems pretty damn solid. So that's what we're going to be installing right here. Uh, a decade was generous. That has a date code of 91. That battery's 30 years old and still is at 3.6. I guess it recharges, but holy shit, the fact that it's holding a charge is insane. I don't have a replacement EEPROM for this yet. We're just going to use the one off the other board for now. I'll get a new one in and get it programmed up, but we're going to reassemble this board a while and put it back in the cabinet and finish up this cabinet, I guess. It works. Now we just need to go through and actually program the prices. This thing flips down so you can actually access it, which I didn't realize. That's really cool. 
Well, let's go through this stupid programming sequence. Okay, so I went through and I set up all the pricing for both the uh, special and the normal. And now it no longer goes to default pricing, it now goes to normal operation whenever it's plugged in. Absolutely awesome. Now we can just put this thing back up and this thing should be fully functional. I guess we gotta test that. Let's add a credit and the only record I have in this is at 101. Yep, perfect. The final thing with the electronics is we have the outer two lit, but the inner two don't seem to be lit. That one might actually be lit, it might just be dim. But that one doesn't appear to be lit. And I know those voltages are here because it wouldn't work without them. So we need to figure out why that is happening. Interestingly, we do actually have a blown fuse in this, which is weird because everything worked. That must be a fuse for like lights or something. I guess we'll replace that. I'm not sure if that's the cause of both our LEDs being bad, but that's definitely going to cause issues. As you can see, this thing was recapped because these super sounds, every single one I've ever opened has had blown caps right here. So these have been recapped. It apparently takes a quarter amp fast low blow fuse, which I don't have any of. So I threw in a half amp fast blow. Hopefully that'll work for testing. I'll order the correct one though. Yeah, I don't, I've never had a quarter amp fuse. Well, it didn't blow and now we have the negative 28 volt LED. So get in progress. I'm not sure what uses t negative 28 volts, apparently not much because it's only a quarter amp fuse, but <laughs> okay. On camera, it looks like the 26 volt one's actually lighting up, so I checked with voltage and it is. It is getting the proper voltage the same as the rest of them, so we just have a bad LED. So I'm just going to replace that LED and we should be able to then see that in person and people won't question why that's not lit up. This right here is the little PCB. This one right here is the one that we're having issues with. These are 1.5 volt LEDs, so I had one in stock. So we're just gonna replace that LED. There we go, it's a slightly different shade of red, but as long as it lights up, uh, it'll be an improvement. Uh, that's a problem. It should not be that bright. <laughs> not sure how they got their LEDs so dim. Uh, maybe they put a higher voltage LED in it. Maybe. I don't have any other ones in, so I just put the original one back in now. At least it kind of lights up and isn't blindingly bright, so. I'll take that over blindingly bright. I'm gonna go ahead and replace all these wedge bulbs that are blown out, which are these two right here. Yeah, that obviously doesn't work. I've never seen one of these that does work. I guess I'll try, but I doubt I'll get anywhere. As you can see, these are relatively simple inside. So uh, we'll try and get this working. I've never succeeded, but hey, I've only ever tried on one other one. Well, that resistor's definitely absolutely cooked my Goodness, that looks like it might have even caught on fire. That's insane. Unfortunately, I can't really go anywhere with this dollar bill acceptor until I get a new 160 watt, 5 watt resistor for right there. Uh, that hasn't caught fire. I also have to get a new transistor most likely for that right there, as I imagine that probably got cooked, as that's the one that was directly above where this thing caught fire. Same with that cap. Probably just going to go ahead and replace all the caps on this. There's not too many. And we'll try to get this thing functional, but I genuinely don't think it's going to be possible. Now I'll order the parts to see if I can fix that dollar bill acceptor. I kind of doubt it, but I'll have to then debate whether or not I keep the dollar bill acceptor in here, even though it's not functional, or if I put on the original block off plate. I don't have any, but I could probably make some block off plates. Originally, whenever they didn't come with a dollar bill acceptor, they just had a block off plate with a Rockola logo in the middle. And I can probably remanufacture that if I, you know, can't get the dollar bill acceptor work. I don't know if I'll want to bother removing it. I mean, I don't really have a use for a bunch of broken dollar bill acceptors either, so maybe I'll just sell it because it looks, but I'll have to mention that the dollar bill acceptor doesn't work, and then I don't know if people will, will pay as much or something doesn't work. I don't know. That'll be a complicated decision to figure out, but hopefully we'll get that to work. I highly doubt it, but maybe. As you can see, we're looking pretty good in here. That obviously works. I've had this thing on for the past few hours. Nothing's blown up. Everything's been rock solid. Absolutely amazing. So I think this thing electronically is pretty much done except for that uh, fuse. We got to put back in the correct uh, fuse and we also need to replace that LED so people can actually see that it has the uh, positive 26 volts on camera. Again, it's mm, clearly see it's lit up on camera, but in person, it's like not visible. I also then have to figure out if I want to buy new tubes for this because, uh, well, who really wants to buy fluorescent tubes in the year 2024 or if I want to find a different way of lighting this across here. I'd hate to have to do that, but I'd also hate to have to buy a fucking fluorescent tube in 2024. But if you like what you saw, please leave a like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.